I think here along the, the rim of the caldera of Batur, um, we can look down across Lombok Strait, which is uh, straight across to Gunung Rijani, as we've seen this morning. I think that's the, probably the clearest definition of Wallace's line, I mean, where it's a biogeographical boundary between two completely different uh, ecosystems. Yeah, I think right here along the, the caldera rim of Kintamani in, in Bali, his way across the strait, he was aiming for Sulawesi, somewhere to the north, couldn't get a boat, um, and so headed off to Lombok and just happened upon what, what's one of the most distinct biological divides anywhere on earth. And uh, I think shortly thereafter he remarked, well, the division between Bali and Lombok, well, you don't have mammals on, on one side, placental mammals, and to the, to the east you see marsupial mammals and very few mammals, mostly birds. And um, here we have tigers and rhinos and at one time even lions and horses over in the west. And in the east, uh, yeah, none of those mammals made it across. So that was quite a puzzle. Well, it seems that these are actually two old supercontinents that are colliding in slow motion. And so you have the, the continent that included Australia and at one time Antarctica and South America. We're all one giant continent. And Laurasia, what's now like North America and Europe and Asia, were another continent. And now they've been divided for at least 250 million years. And now they're slowly coalescing again right here in Indonesia. There's all sorts of tectonic uplift because of that. So little mountain, little mountainous islands are popping up, little volcanoes like we're standing on right now. And so we have these sort of stepping stones piling up between these two continents. At one point, we can presume that Asia will probably reunite with Australia. But until that time, we only have tiny little stepping stones that are sort of natural filters. Certain creatures can cross those barriers and, and a lot of them can't. And then once a creature does happen to colonize an island, you'll have a lot of bizarre evolution taking place as well. You get a lot of endemic creatures that sort of develop in isolation and, and take on all sorts of bizarre evolutionary forms that would probably not be very adaptive. They probably couldn't get away with those sorts of bizarre strategies if they were competing with more life forms on a larger continent. Now, a lot of people would think that the Komodo dragon is a giant because it's our, it's our largest living relative today, right? I mean, it's their closest thing to a dinosaur. And um, yeah, that's a popular conception. But it turns out they're now living on two fairly tiny islands. And these are just dwarfs of what they had been. Even over on Flores, where we have the, the recent hobbit discovery, the little tiny person about a meter high, um, that's clearly an island dwarf. That's a very tiny human. But he was living with dragons that were actually probably about half again as long as the dragons that we find on Komodo today. And even over on Australia, there were other dragons that were maybe twice as big, as the, twice as long, in fact, as the dragons we have today. So really, the, the remnant Komodo dragons that we see now are actually just tiny island dwarfs. And uh, yeah, there's also on Flores, you also had tiny, um, mammoth-like creatures, little elephants that were maybe cow-sized, um, giant rats the size of your house cat, or even a hefty house cat at that, and uh, just, yeah, bizarre forms that you would never expect anywhere else. So, so why would some creatures shrink and, and, and others become bigger? Right. In the same, under the same circumstances? Yeah. Well, a lot of these creatures, when they're inhabiting or colonizing a volcanic island, they kind of have the, the run of things. So if they can like occupy an ecological niche that isn't yet occupied, they can really experiment with evolutionary forms and get away with a lot of things that maybe they didn't have opportunities to when they were in, com in competition with, with more life forms. Now, a lot of a trend will tend to be that predators um, if their food supply is large, will tend to get larger. They can afford to, to do that. Um, a lot of the you know, scavengers, like rats as well, they had lots of opportunities for, for food sources that other creatures weren't, weren't uh, taking advantage of. So they didn't have to compete with cats and dogs and things like that. So why shouldn't they be cat-sized 
they can get around better. Um, meanwhile, humans, I mean, it was pretty, probably a pretty scarce environment for them, or modern humans, as well as the uh, Homo floresiensis, the, the hobbits, they probably had a pretty hard time of it. And um, their primary prey was were these tiny mammoth-like uh, elephant creatures, stegodon, who are also quite tiny as well. And so, yeah, it's probably all has to do with the balance of resources. If there's scant resources for certain creatures, they'll tend to downsize. Yeah, it all has to do with the availability of resources. So if an animal moves in and it, there's a scant supply of the resources it needs to thrive, then it will tend to downsize. If it moves into a niche and there's an abundance of resource, resources and no other creatures that are taking advantage of those, then they'll tend to, to get larger. Where we are here, now on Bali, is actually once connected to the entire Malay Peninsula. And all of the islands to the west of here, Java, Sumatra, um, Kalimantan even, they were once one giant peninsula, just an extension of Malaysia, basically. And right as you drop off the edge of Bali here, you drop into a massive rift. These were actually not connected at any time, even with lower sea levels during ice ages. And so the islands, within what's known as Wallacea, this kind of central Indonesian zone, um, past Wallace's line, are really just isolated islands that all have quite deep uh, straits separating them. And some of those are actually taking most of the water that's pouring from the Pacific Ocean into the Indian Ocean. So you get some ripping currents as well. In fact, Wallace had a hard time making it across to Lombok and even yeah, a lot of modern boats um, anywhere in Indonesia will have their worst time actually crossing this strait, um, straits near Komodo and Flores as well. You get some ripping currents. So some folks, it's been commonly thought that a lot of the colonization, you know, those creatures who did make it across the barrier, across Wallace's line and colonize islands east of here, it's been thought generally that they sort of poured down the Malaysian Peninsula and then hopped across islands to the east, but now some, including the, the, one of the principal hobbit discoverers, Mike Morwood, would tend to think that probably most creatures colonized by drifting south with the currents from Sulawesi, maybe from somewhere up in the, neighbor of the neighborhood of the Philippines, Sulawesi, and sort of drifted in um, following currents. Yeah, well, the strait takes on what's known as the Indonesian through flow. The, the Lombok Strait takes on what's known as the Indonesian through flow. And that's um, this massive flow of water, um, about maybe the scale of about 1,000 Amazon rivers in, in scale. Um, and it's really one of few, a, a, few, a very few portals of water that connect the, the entire Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. Now around this time of year, as we get into June, July, August, the trade winds across the Pacific Ocean will pick up and you'll actually pile water from the Pacific Ocean up against China and against the Western Pacific. And the sea level there will be actually about 15 centimeters higher than it is over in the Indian Ocean just down here, right where we're standing. I mean, we're looking at the Pacific Ocean, towards the Pacific Ocean there and the Indian Ocean right here. So right through this strait, you have this waterfall. Okay, it's 15 centimeters across a long distance, but you do have quite a flux of water from the Pacific into the Indian Ocean here. It turns out it's all happening in a very narrow strait, so it can be quite difficult to get across, even for, for modern humans with, with boats with engines and whatnot. Wallacea are a bunch of scattered islands, sort of stepping stones between Asia and Australia, most broadly. But within Indonesia, it's basically everything east of Bali. It basically describes these stepping stone islands between Asia and, and Australia, two ancient continents that are now reuniting. And uh, broadly, it's, it's basically east of Bali and west of Papua, which is Papua being connected to Australia and Bali at lower sea levels being connected to the Malay Peninsula. And all of the islands in between are surrounded by deep water and so it could only be colonized by things that could swim or float or fly or raft ashore by some sort of sweepstakes colonization. And so it tend to have a very depauperate uh, fauna. Not very many animals have made it there. 
And those that have, have evolved into some very bizarre forms that you don't see anywhere else on Earth. Even today, I mean, we need to fly there and, and whatnot, and a lot of the inner mountainous interiors, people aren't exploring that often. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of sort of untold discoveries. There's some, still some very exciting discoveries being made even today that are rewriting our own story of human evolution, um, biology, um, and whatnot. story that rewrote human evolution, I think, um, turned it on its head, the discovery of a very tiny human with a head about a third of the size of modern humans, fully grown, but the size of a newborn baby's skull, um, and yet quite intelligent, able to work in groups, presumably having language so that they could conquer dragons, uh, varanid dragons, something similar to Komodo dragons that are about half again as big as the ones that we see today on neighboring islands in Komodo. Um, what inspired that discovery uh, is that these very islands here, the island of Komodo leading into Flores, where Homo floresiensis, this, this new human, was found, um, it's basically like humans, uh, humanity's maritime Apollo mission. This was uh, the first island where it's known that humans actually had to cross a, a water barrier to reach. And it happened quite early on. Um, now it's taken back to about a million years ago um, in dating. But the first discovery that, that really inspired uh, anthropologists to be looking more closely at Flores was stone tools. were first dated back as far back as 840,000 years ago. And nowhere else on Earth had humans actually crossed any kind of water barrier. So it's quite uh, an accomplishment, really. Even today, I mean, if you get a boat across some of these currents between Komodo and Flores, you'll have a hard time. These are currents that are ripping through from the Pacific to the, to the Indian Oceans. And so, uh, yeah, it says a lot about our early human ancestors, that they were actually quite clever. The islands between Flores and Komodo, known for some very strange life forms. Uh, even today, Komodos are the largest living lizards of any kind, so our largest reptiles akin to sort of modern-day dinosaurs, the best that we have. Every other island um, where dragons have been known, some form of varanid lizards, um, we have quite a consistent record throughout Indonesia. And I think it's, it's shown all throughout the world. It just works out that Indonesia is a very convenient laboratory for that because we have so many repeated experiments on so many individual islands all across Indonesia, especially Wallacea. Here in uh, central, small mammoth-like creatures um, of that time. And so this discovery uh, that humans had actually colonized any sort of island that long ago inspired a, a much greater effort to be applied to known archaeological sites in Flores. It's quite rich with caves, and caves are great at preserving remains of humans. Humans like to live in caves, and it's a very friendly environment for preserving those remains. And so these discoveries inspired some renewed efforts uh, at, at archaeological digs in those caves. Uh, yeah, these discoveries at Soa Basin inspired some renewed interest in... So they worked in 10 centimeter layers and document each and every stone tool and each and every bone. These are stegodon bones, and these are some sorts of tools. Now, for a long time, they found these layers of tools going down, but they didn't know who they belonged to. They didn't find any actual remains of the humans that had created these tools and presumably eaten these small mammoth-like creatures, the stegodons. Uh, some of the layers are incredibly productive. I mean, they can't get anywhere. It takes you know, several days just to work through a very productive layer like this. It's very, very tedious. Uh, sometimes, before you even find evidence of any modern humans, you just see a, a rapid transition of fauna. Um, now, here, that also happens to be related to a volcanic layer. Now, you might think, okay, was there a, a big volcanic 
explosion um, that wiped out a lot of creatures there. Um, but at this site and many others, this faunal turnover happens to correlate to the arrival of modern humans. And at so many of these sites, even before you find remains, the smoking gun, so to speak, if you apply more efforts, you sure enough start turning up human tools, modern human tools and, and remains. And that's the same here at Leon Bua. And so it begs the question, um, were we responsible for the demise of hobbits as we have been responsible for the demise of so many other creatures all throughout Indonesia, all throughout the world? I mean, we are experiencing what seems to be the, the greatest mass extinction of all time right now um, at our hands. And sure enough, these, these volcanic deposits, um, I mean, we have a lot of active volcanoes in Flores. The first guess would be that it's from a very local volcano. But actually, some geochemistry on these ash deposits suggests that it was, may have, in fact, been a very distant volcano from Bali, about 600 kilometers from Flores. And so presumably not actually one that would pose any particular threat to creatures living there. <laughs>